welcome all to another broadcast of The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available as podcasts. You can download them at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions and comments. Hit us up by email to dj at artistfirst.com. And here they are, your co-hosts, Michael and Margaret Lotz. <laughs> I need to be refreshed. Um, what were we doing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Scott. Uh, we, we, uh, we are totally, totally prepared. Good. Good. Um, we are prepared, but, uh, you know, not being, the fear of being unprepared is an egoic state. Yes, definitely. definitely. And for those of you who are fans of Eckhart Tolle, you'll know what I'm talking about. But basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, largely when you are, um, when you're discussing something with uh, a friend or with a group that you know well, uh, you don't prepare your remarks uh, and you don't prepare um, how you're going to respond to their remarks because you you have that sort of internal um, confidence, if you will. It's it's when you think that you you know it, when your ego gets involved that you uh, you sit there and you you uh, stress out over what you're going to say and whether people are going to like you because you're you're letting the other's perception of you influence um, you know your own you know your own state of being and. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about that in, in one regard because um, you, uh, I think, very recently were watching a um, a video that Tole had put up, and the, the the actual title of the video was "Can the Ego Surrender Itself to the Light of Consciousness?" Correct? Yes, yes, that was it. And it's you know, in and of itself, it it, it just um, is a it's a wonderful question. I'm not sure if was that the question that he got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he goes through these question and answer periods. And uh, I was struck by the woman who was asking this question because there was quite a bit of distress on her face when she asked it. Um, she obviously has been uh, going down this path of trying to let go and allow that light of consciousness, as she calls it, to to come forward. And her description of it was interesting, because she said, uh, when you get a crack in the ego and that light of consciousness comes through, Mm. that was her description. And I thought that was fascinating. Mm. It is fascinating, because it almost, it seems that the ego is some sort of shell of darkness that you hide in. Um, but but I, I like that. But I, but the ego surrender itself to the light of consciousness. What I got from that, um, and I we put it up on the website and it will be up there soon. But what I got from that was that it's basically we're we're couching this whole thing in the terms of some sort of battle, you know, between two entities. Call it consciousness and the ego. And um, I think that that right away is couching the whole thing in the wrong sort of terms. Right. Uh, and T- Tolly has said this, and we've we've articulated it as well. Is that the ego is um, is a part of you? You know, one of the other talks we had some time back was this idea that the 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 ego is is sailing upon a, a sh- you know is building a ship to sail upon the sea of death, and and you know in essence um, this sort of uh, very poetic way of describing uh, this this egoic existence. The ego wants to be in a a thing, you know. It wants to consider itself a vehicle. It wants the the con, you know, the the part of it which is, um, you know, the the uh, the little voice inside your head. It wants it to be it to be riding around inside the ego mobile, and that everything is is how we are perceived and how we perceive the world and is it good for us is it bad for us is it is it too much is it too little it's always judgment 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 and this this idea that you articulated but the woman had said in this video of of you know all of a sudden there's a crack in the ego and the light shines through and it's almost like you're you know you're somehow transitioning 
and out of an egg uh, and and uh, you've been or Plato's cave right you know where you're you're in the dark and you're behind the screens and you're watching the shadows on the wall and all of a sudden there's a crack in the cave and and the light of actual day streams in and that's that's I think very evocative and, and good but but the true you know the true perception is that the ego is is a necessary perhaps something which um, not only is necessary but but a, a a required step on the the path from sort of an unconscious state to a to a fully conscious state uh, and so therefore it's not um, you know it's not something that you have to defeat as much as understand and outgrow I mean it's sort of like an egg in that regard because you say well you know you develop for a certain amount of time within this protected form call it the ego and then you have to break out of it why because one of the reasons is you you grow too big uh, you know yes it's um in many ways it's understanding that you're going through an evolutionary process or think of it as a school you're going through your grades Oh yeah, that's good. And when that happens, like when you're learning, um, each step is a skill set. Um, and to think of the ego as a lesson plan. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> or a paint by numbers. <laughs> Paint my numbers. Well, um, it, 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 it's teaching you something. Uh, you know what I mean? It's, but it's not truly painting. Or in this case, it's teaching you something, but it's not truly, you know, operating. It's a lesson plan. I like it. Well, it, it, it's the concept is something that is um, been held for thousands of years that you're coming down here to learn something. Mm. Uh, and you're going through lifetimes in order to to learn what it is that you participated in agreeing that you need to learn. Mm. The idea is that you're on the other side uh, looking at your soul, and looking at your soul means that you see everything, all the good and all the bad, and you're mm. looking at yourself going, this is not allowing the light to shine through. My soul is dark in this area. Mm. I need to clear that somehow. And this is where you get all these different concepts of how to clear this this darkness. Um, and the world is full of many different ways and experiences of learning how to bring light into that cloudy bit of your soul. So... If you go down the path and suddenly you realize that, you know, the, going down this path of um, a religious stricture, this is going to help put some light, some consciousness into this unconscious part of me. Mm. In, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, they basically say, you know, you, you didn't learn this, you got to learn this. So... What parents are there where you can be born into this environment that will give you the background in order to take steps in mm. bringing light to that dark part of your soul? And this is a, a lesson plan that you agree to. I'm not saying it's easy. Um... And I'm not saying that uh, once you understand that, that this is happening, that you can't change it. The whole idea is to become aware in that moment that you're more than your situation. It's kind of interesting. You're being put into these situations to make you realize that you are more than what's around you. Yeah, and I think that's that's the important. Well, sorry, that's one of the important things here, 
is that initially, I think you're right. I think um, I, I would say the initial thrust is to, as you said, in, bring light into these cloudy or dark areas. And and I think I, I, I when I, I know people say this, they say, oh, this part of my soul is dark. But I think we also egoically in egoic terms assign that as being lesser or you know it, that you need to bring light to the darkness and i think you as you grow out of that shell you realize that you're not bringing light to the darkness nor are you dark in any particular way you just are um unable to realize that consciousness is you always was you and that the egoic form is a way of of, as you said, realizing that you are so much more than the, you, 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 you use it as a lesson plan or as a framework to bring this energy, which is coming into being yet not yet fully conscious right. up into consciousness. So it's a way, if you think of consciousness as, as the all, as not just your individual consciousness, but the all, it's a way for consciousness to, in essence, um, bring up the frequency of the all. Uh, so there's a spectrum, and you have consciousness, but you also have a great vast, let's call it that, you know, the ocean that we're sailing on top of, the great vast unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a tremendous amount of energy and potential there that you come up through these forms. Think of these forms as the egoic forms, as the soul forms, as the incarnate forms. And so Hotoli always talks about the universe of form, but it's important because the, in the universe of form, you can have the experiences, the universe of experiences that you have here. And they mold, shape, and slowly dissolve this attachment to the ego. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and you get into the consciousness. But I think people do initially term it, in, in, or rather couch it in terms of a battle. Uh, you know, I'm as this woman said. What you know, I get a crack in the ego, and I can finally see the light shining through. And both those things are are incorrect in different ways. Right. You're, you're not trying to defeat the ego. Uh, you're you're kind of trying to understand and then outgrow um, the ego. And, and maybe 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 I'll read the quote that we put up, which is also illustrative. What do you think? If you'd like, sure. I think maybe you should read it. Oh, okay. Because you're better at reading it than I am. All righty. Uh, this is a quote by uh, Eckhart Tolle. You cannot fight against the ego and win, just as you cannot fight against the darkness. The light of consciousness is all that is necessary. You are that light. Yes. So, in other words, if when your light turns on, it dissipates darkness, and therefore your ego dissipates. And it's an interesting thought, because, you know, you think of an ego as uh, an entity of mm. some kind. And this is just letting you know that this is, it, it seems to be an entity, it acts like an entity, but it is almost like a, how do I say this? It's like an avatar of your consciousness. Mm. Mm. You know, your consciousness is vast, and all of your consciousness cannot fit into existence in this point in space and time. Therefore, you, you designate an avatar representative of you down here to interact and to have experiences. Mm. Um, so, it has a form when it comes down into an avatar form. And the ego would like to take over that entire avatar. <laughs> The yeah. avatar that you have chosen is not only ego. People think that. Like, no, you're more than who you think you are. Your avatar is even more than what you think it is. Hmm. You know, most people come, 
again, we talk about the stories you tell yourself. So you have a certain story you're telling yourself about the avatar that happens to be walking in the here and now. Mm. And it's always interesting to stop for a moment and take stock of where you are in your story that you're telling yourself. (laughs) Right. Because, Because when you do that, you touch upon the consciousness that is, that is always observing, that has always been there, and doesn't need a story to exist. That's where your actual identity is. It's not the story that you tell yourself. Because in stories, you always get uh, an antagonist and a protagonist. And when you're telling yourself a story like this, you're both. Mm -hmm. So you have an internal conflict set up automatically. And talk about stress levels. You just drive yourself bananas. Well, well, as you often do, you put a lot into a few sentences. But I, I was struck in the beginning of your sentences there when you said, you know, the form and the ego... Because the avatar, rather, you, you know, the 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 avatar is is a um, is a manifestation of your consciousness, absolutely. Within the avatar, or or as part of the avatar, you manifest again this this ego, and then the ego begins the telling of the story. And the story of the ego is that I am everything, I am everything, and that. I own this body, and I'm piloting the body around, and I must judge all things and, and, and experience all things and, and be all. Um, and in some regards, it's, it's a necessary thing. The, the first in, instantiation of you, of your consciousness as an avatar within this world, um, needs the ego. It needs the ego to drive it forward, to to kind of get initial perceptions, to start to evaluate what's going on here. But as again, as you very clearly said, um, the, the, the existence of the avatar and the existence of the ego Im- immediately um, require an origin of, of some type. And we all know it. We all know that we, we aren't this dull matter, nor are we our thoughts or our emotions. We know that, but then we stop because the ego stops us. It says, "No, no, no, no. We don't get. We can't go outside this." She called it a like this shell that, you, that gets the crack. Can't go outside because it'll be, it'll be outside of us. You know, it will be terrible. And so the ego tells you these wonderful stories, constantly having an antagonist, a protagonist, a, um, you know, a conflict, a resolution, a, a hero, a, right. all all these wonderful things. And and it's all throughout our mythos, and it's all throughout. But but yet, regardless, as you go through these transitional states, you're you're almost dragged out perforce into realizing that you are something beyond, because there is some part of you which is observing. And if you pull yourself out, and this is Tolles, and pull yourself out of form, pull yourself out of ego, and say, what is observing? That's his whole technique. Mm-hmm. He says, okay, here you are. You have a body, you have a soul, you have emotions, you have an ego, you have all these things. But but if you wonder, on what are they sitting? On, on what are they existing? How are these things, which are totally unrelated to each other, are, are they related through this observer, through the thing which is when, when you are unconscious, when you are unaware, when you are just outside of your ego just observing that which observes is your consciousness and it doesn't require an ego and once you get there you're at that precipice of jumping off you have to kind of the ego is required in essence to almost give the um, give the viewpoint of the observer by deduction say well there's an ego and there's a body and there's all these things well what's what's keeping them all you know what's keeping an eye on them all (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is there, is there, you know, what's keeping an eye on all these things? What, what is, what is behind it all? You know, what's behind the curtain, moving the puppets, if you will. And so, um, this question that Tully posed here, in response to the question that he got, 
uh, or rather the statement that he said, you cannot fight against the ego and win, because this is what the woman was really asking. You know, she's saying, well, how do I, how do I let consciousness win? How do, how does consciousness overcome the ego? And her main question what was really concerning her is how do I make my ego surrender? Exactly. She's been fighting with herself, trying to force her ego to surrender. Exactly. And you sit there and you go, really you realize that that does not happen. You can't force someone to surrender that way. It it, it doesn't happen. Well, uh, uh, yes, because that someone is, it's like saying, how do I force my finger to surrender to the hand? And, well, no, the hand and the finger are related. They're part of each other. They're all part of the body. And, and, you know, you can't say that the finger is somehow in rebellion. Well, in one way, you can say, well, the finger is trying to run the hand, you know, and tell the hand what to do. Um, But really, in, in truth, there's no conflict here because it's all you. And it's a, it's a made up, it, it, the, the, the question itself, how do I force the ego to surrender is all in the ego. <laughs> you know, when you, there's a wonderful trick that you can, not a trick, but a, a wonderful exercise, which you've done in, in many times with people, is to try and couch your thoughts without using I, or couch a conversation without using I. Because you, you then, because of the way you, will interact with yourself and with others, you'll find that you are um, wholly dependent on this expression of I, me, I, me. And this is the ego. This is the identity. This is, I'm talking about me, but, you know, what, enough of me talking about me. What do you think about me? So it's all, it's all that. And uh, it's very interesting because what it means is that you interpret everything that's happening around you through this filter of I, identity, what you've chosen that is your identity, instead of the experience is as it is. Right. It's got to go, come through this filter of I. And when you understand that that filter of I means it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I think people don't make that connection. Well, uh, uh, well, I say you're right, of course, in general, but in in specific. Uh, so this woman is trying to get there, and and her her way of trying to get there is that the the consciousness will win out over the ego, uh, you know, and Tole very gently and and as he does says basically says you're sort of asking the wrong question. You know, you can't fight the ego and win because you cannot, you know, consciousness doesn't try to defeat the ego, nor does the ego necessarily surrender to the consciousness. It becomes um, a realization. Right. That (laughs) there is no conflict. Right. Most people, that's the... uh, Here's an interesting thought as well. We always think of the dichotomy of light and shadow, or light and dark. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the truth of the matter is, there is no conflict there. No. They just happen to be a description of what is happening with light hmm. and its interaction. I'm not saying that there isn't uh, good or evil. That's a whole different dis- dis- uh, discussion. I'm talking about observing light and darkness and that interplay. And when the mind assumes this white and this black there are two polarities only, and then there must be a war between the two. Mm. It's very um, two-dimensional. Yeah. And, and the other observation, of course, that has been made many times is that there really is no darkness. There's just the absence of light. 
Um, but the, the the part that people don't realize is there's really no light either. <laughs> you know, there there the perception of light and dark is an egoic thing. There's there's energy and an energy it's that, mind thing. Yes, right, that's a little bit different from ego. Well, uh, okay, um, but in some ways it's a distinction that's important. But in other ways, it really comes down to again consciousness. Uh, totally refers to the light of consciousness and that you are that light because those were the terms that the questioner gave him. You know that the light of consciousness is breaking through the shell of the ego. But her whole question in in it in its premise, and he was very kind. He did say, "Well, your whole question is in essence wrong," because well, he didn't say that. But. No, no, I know, but but, and I wouldn't say it to someone like that either. Nor nor would I probably be asked it because I don't have the. But the 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 whole idea of a consciousness, which is in somehow trying to defeat, is like saying I have a light which is trying to defeat the shadow, and that if enough light is there, that there will never be shadow again. Well, well, well no. What the what you say is that the light and the shadow are all consciousness. That that the definitions themselves are in some ways um, conveniences more than they are nece- necessities. The, the definition of the ego and of form and of ex- of all these things which we we bring into this existence are important things, but in the end, in the end, not um, not necessary things. Right. Um, knowing for people's process mm. is always a very important thing because um, you have identified yourself with an idea, a concept, a group, um, And that's the only thing that you know. Mm. To begin to change that produces an internal pain. Yes. Stepping into territory you've never seen before. It's a little scary. And you don't have anything to relate it to necessarily. Right. It's it's similar as we said with you know with Plato's wonderful description of the cave because the the ones who he would try to free resisted. Right. He resisted. Um, well, let, let's try this. Let's see if we can free the audience for a few minutes. Let's go back to the studio, listen to a few commercials, and when we come back on the other side, we will talk more about consciousness. Rick Rodan fans, love mythology with plenty of action and humor? Destroyer's Blood is for you. The new fantasy novel by award-winning author Michael Lines is book one of the adventures of Dev Kalian, the Blood series. Follow Dev and his magic sword betrayer as they are suddenly attacked and forced to return to Olympus to fight in a war they want no part in. The world of men and gods is about to be destroyed by Zeus's ancient foe, and only Dev and Trey can stop him. The conflict never stops, and the amazing twist will have you on the edge of your seat. Act now while the ebook is on sale for only 99 cents. Destroyer's Blood is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. And while you're there, get the free prequel. It's in the blood, available for a limited time. The wait is over. First Blood, book two of the Blood series is out. Your favorite bad boy thief, Dev, is back. And the beautiful and deadly Trey is right there with him. She is sharp, sexy, and full of surprises. 
Their adventures continue as a new power arises to threaten the world. The heart of creation is under attack and time is definitely not on their side as they battle against their enemies' undead hordes. Can they unlock the hidden power that can defeat him or will his forces draw first blood? Get all three installments in the series. Book Zero, It's in the Blood. Book One, Destroyer's Blood. And the new release, Book Two, First Blood Today. Available in ebook and paperback format on Amazon, Kobo, Apple, and most other fine e tailers. Hi, this is Hannah Ruth from the band Wild Hum. Check out our new Americana Soul CD, Wild Hum, at our website, W I L D H U M music.com. And you are listening to the Artist First Radio Network. Thank you. There is a Reaper is the story of five year old Christopher Aaron and his life changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir, There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five star rating. It has been described as life changing, spiritual, a must read. Just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, the fat man gets out of bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. You're listening to the soul of the everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. Let's get back to your hosts, Michael and Margaret Lines. Thank you very much, Z-Man. And um, and tonight we've been talking a little bit about. Um, well, I guess this was really inspired by by Eckhart Tolle, who is a really a lovely. Um, he wouldn't call himself a guru, but it, he certainly is treated treated like one. Uh, but in this, you know, in this particular. Um, talk which i think was really first described in the power of now wasn't it it's, it was one of his first one of his first books because that was really describing his enlightenment we talked about a little bit in the first half hour um consciousness the fact that that you realize you come you become aware of the observer and and you know that in and of itself there's a little bit of of interesting um because consciousness both it becomes aware of the fact that it's observing and consciousness becomes aware of consciousness there's a we we saw a show sometime back where they were talking about you know the nature of consciousness because it's something we don't really understand very well when you talk about the scientific nature of consciousness people don't really um know what you know what is the difference between a conscious or an unconscious brain? What is the difference between, um, you know, what is consciousness? Is the is the mind creating it, or is it some other phenomenon? And we don't want to go terribly too deep into that. But the point of it is that that consciousness is also aware of consciousness. You're conscious that you're conscious, and it goes all the way down. It's turtles all the way down, and so the enlightenment that Tolle. Um, is talking about here is that consciousness becomes aware that it's observing the ego, that the world and form are all things which are, which are part of it, but not all of it. You you suddenly become aware that form is has a presence, and then consciousness is that which observes the presence of all things. And in and its own presence, you become aware of your own consciousness. You become conscious of your consciousness, and and the ego itself is the opposite in many regards. The ego 
doesn't want to be aware of anything else but it but the ego and so it denies the existence of all other things it says it's all me i i i i i i i consciousness is not like that at all right um and we had said before that the ego is a result of uh, the physical body interacting with its outside world trying to mm. figure out what is it and what isn't it mm. in a physical uh, incarnation well your physical form how it interacts mm. you know this is my hand that's, and that's not my, my hand and that's not mm. attached to me mm-hmm. you know, that's something in the distance how far away or what is as a small child you're just trying to figure out well what am I seeing and is that me? Like, mm. I love it when the baby f- tries to figure out where its hands are and it winds up smacking itself in the head. Mm. It's just, you know, you, you begin to learn what is you and what's not you. And and who did that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that is, in a nutshell, kind of what our experience is. And once you begin to do that discernment, then you start expanding into things that uh, taste good or bad, uh, different tastes, different smells, uh, touching things and the sensation, seeing, hearing, and what certain sounds do to you. It's, it's um, part of what the ego begins to do in discerning. And that's a lot of work. Mm. I mean, the development of a a small infant into a toddler, the amount of learning that happens in those stages is phenomenal. Um, And understanding that the ego is also a product of that. It begins to do that. But then it gets extended into what I like and what I don't like. Mm. And then... There's a part of the ego that basically says, well, let me, let me dominate this so we don't ever have to feel anything that I don't like. Mm. I think that, that's kind of the core of what happens here. It's response to the fact that, hey, I don't really want to experience that, that really bad thing. Mm. Or maybe that bad thing is going to happen at any second now. <laughs> well, you're very the, the the beginnings are really just orientation, mm-hmm. but the 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 ego seizes upon that and says that I I like I don't like, and then I only want to find things that I like, and so it 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 starts the I machine. You know, the the mm-hmm. I must control this. I must think about this. I must, you know, be. Um, satisfied. I must identify with this and not with that. Uh, we mentioned um, before the show that we're talking about the ego is also the thing which uh, wants to identify with the group and say, you know, you are you are with me and you are not with me. I, you're my friend. You're my enemy. You're. This is all um, the egoic stuff, and yet. Um, and the stories begin, of course, and you're telling yourself all the stories about those which are good and those which are not good, and, and just on and on and on. And so you, you, you end up with um, a tremendous amount of your day-to-day energy, sometimes all of your day-to-day energy, in the, in, as Tolle calls them, the densest egos, if you will. And by dense, he doesn't mean dumb. He's really talking about just really the thickness, <laughs> the true weight of your ego. Uh, it becomes it becomes a, an all-consuming thing, and yet there are be there are moments in everyone, even the the most thick ego, where you are taken out of it for an instant, for a breath, and it's to follow that. It's to follow the fact that yes, all this is happening, yet there's still something beyond it, and it's as you said, scary. Well, it's a response to fear. Yes. To- seems to be a thickening of the ego, which I find fascinating. You you basically wind up putting layer upon layer of your ego response as a defense to what you're afraid of. Mm. 
And that's that experience is quite a, a a teaching moment for yourself or quite a learning moment for yourself because eventually your shell can be so thick that there is no light that's able to penetrate through. Hmm. And what you have is misery because you as a, a human being, as a soul, you were never meant to be alone. Hmm. But your ego is isolating you and because of the fear you're you're adding layer upon layer upon layer of what you think may happen to you Hmm. but again we've always said this and this is constant for everyone you've got to come to the end of yourself you got to realize that there's no life in a, a solidified ego like that. Mm. And that's probably why she was saying, the lady that was asking the question, you know, there's a crack in the ego and there's some light coming through. Mm. And Tolle's response, I thought, was marvelous. Um, he basically equated it to being a caterpillar mm. and going into a chrysalis. And to realize that as a caterpillar, you were happy. Or it was happy. But eventually it gets to the point where it eats all the leaves and there's no more food. So it has to form a chrysalis in order to come into another stage because it's time. Mm. The chrysalis or the ego has reached its maturation and has done its job and allowed that soft body that is within it to transform into something that can fly and enter into a whole new stage of existence. Um, It was so beautifully put. Mm. And to understand that that's what's happening now. There's a lot of people screaming Their egos are cracking, but do you embrace the fact that now you've got to take a step outside of the ego, let it fall away, and take steps up into a higher existence, a higher form of consciousness? It it, it was certainly, that's, that's a beautiful analogy. And um, you can see it, you know, Tolle is maybe the latest, and certainly he would just go back and look at, you know, it, Buddha's all life is suffering. It's basically all life in the ego, in the form, becomes suffering. Um, yes, there are periods of time when, when you can feel good about it, but the the layers of ego form because of that which comes against you, that which you don't like, you know, which you're trying to defend against. And And um, his enlightenment was in the same way that that Tolle's is. It it came in and it's basically realizing that that none of that, that all of it rather, can be contained in the light of consciousness. That coming outside, yes, the the analogy of breaking the ego, breaking the chrysalis is, is a beautiful one. But you don't have to break anything, truly. Uh, You really just have to realize it. But it's it's not easy. The ego will pull at you and, and try to survive and try to uh, keep you within. It's, it's, it, in some ways, it's not a chrysalis. It becomes sort of a... Um, it fights against the, the dissolution of, of itself. You know, it's almost... It, it, it's a chrysalis that wants to keep you inside. <laughs> but there's only death at that point. Sure. And, and, um, it's the end. There's nothing left. Well, and it's it's funny that you say because oftentimes, oftentimes, um, people in extremis, like who have reached the end of themselves, have reached the end of of life, or reached the end of a great struggle, struggle and trial, will will come to that in a different way. They'll say, you know, all of this, all this burning away of my form, all of this, you know, whether it's disease or whether it's whatever it is, has shown me that I'm more. 
you know, because I still am. I still, you know, I, the little I no longer, the consciousness is still a being, regardless of what's happened to my form, regardless of what's hap- of the things that I can't control. So that way of getting there is another way. Any way you get to the end of self. Right. It, the ego has its place. Mm. Okay, it's never truly destroyed in that no. sense. It's allowing for who you are to expand past the ego, but inclusive of the ego. This is this is part of a a soul iteration, a soul life, and there's nothing wrong with it. But it has its place. To so understand that you are so much more than an ego, and so much more than this particular lesson plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I want to I go back to what you just said because it's exactly perfect. The, the ego um, tells itself that this will destroy it. And, and part of that fear, part of the ego thickening, is that it, it says if we reach the end of ourselves, we will be destroyed. Uh, and none of that is true, but yet that's the fear that somehow if I let go of the ego, that there will be nothing more of me. I'll be gone. Mm. You know, my identity. And it, 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 it's not the death of identity. It's the, as you said, it's the realization that identity has its place, that identity is not destroyed by consciousness. Tole is still Tole, and, and whomever becomes in the, to this state still has a form for a period of time, but you realize it's just for a period of time. Still has an ego for, for however long it's useful or for in whatever situation is it useful, but you realize at all times, once you get here, that the ego is merely something which you can use. It becomes a tool. A lesson plan goes from becoming a... Um, you know, uh, 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 absolute, you know, step one, step two, step three, a, a stricture becoming a tool. It's like, oh yeah, you know, if we need to, we can inhabit ego for a little while and talk to people in that regard. If we need to, we can inhabit form for a while and, you know, live in the actual moment of a body. As Tolly says, you just look at the body and say, oh, the body's so nice, you know. But yet, all of that becomes within and in the context of the vastness which is you which you say you know right now I'm just going to go into consciousness and just you know be there just be there without ego without form without regard uh, and understand that 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 is always there and then you and then you're there and and then people look at you say you don't look any different nope (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because I'm not any different. And that's the whole point of this, is that the ego is the one who wants everything to look different. Oh, you know, if I, if I do this and I do this and I do this and I paint my face and I wear these clothes and I'll be all these different things. No, you're still just you. And the ego's like, ah, I don't want to be me. <laughs> I want to be someone else. <laughs> no. Well, it's a uh, um, <laughs> consciousness at that point is is capable of showing through mm. uh, how do I explain this um, the iteration that you have down here um, what was it now they found what was the study that you were reading where they have discovered that um, the pr- the brain is not a um oh it's a transducer rather than a um a producer of consciousness right the brain is because in science that has always been the assumption that the brain produces consciousness but now they're looking at things and they are looking at it in terms of the brain is actually a transducer of consciousness no you should define that term. I know what it means, but um, a transducer is something which 
transforms one form of energy into another. So the simplest transducer would be something like a microphone where you use audible energy and it turns it into electrical energy. That's called a transducer. So in this case, consciousness, that which is all, is transduced into form, into, into bodies, into physical. And it's also a step-down process. Yes, it can be. In other words, you're, you're bringing a higher energy into a manageable form to, to be able to transmit it someplace or use it in another form. Yes. So to understand that your consciousness, which is larger than the brain, mm. and the brain is a, a mechanism by which your consciousness is able to interact all the other consciousnesses running around here. Hmm. Dream the common dream is, is right. transducing in, though. Yeah, we have to transduce in in order to interact. Right. Um, and it's limiting all the, the different aspects of consciousness, but in a form where we can actually coexist and work things out. <laughs> because I think that if we were in our pure form and the energy frequencies were quite not right, we might wind up making a whole big mess somewhere. Well, and the other uh, transducers are, the other interesting thing about transducers is they are usually bidirectional. In other words, um, when I speak into this microphone, uh, somebody on the other end hears it. Well, they hear it uh, not as an electrical impulse, they hear it as something audible in their headphones, for argument's sake. So there's two transducers involved here. But our brains, as a transducer of consciousness, are two-way. So we, we, we are not just um, taking consciousness and putting it into form. We're also taking what we learn here, what, what we experience here, how we do things here in this sandbox where we play and interact in a in a let's say a safer or at least a different type of environment, we transduce that back up into consciousness, whether it's at the end of life or all during that time. I think you could even have an argument to say that your consciousness is enjoying the experience right. of, being, of being within form. We do it because it's not, not just because it's a chore, but because it's necessary and it's also enjoyable. Right. No, this is, this is the reason why we're here, mm -hmm. is to have the experience of what it means to be in a physical form and to be alive. Yes. And it is a precious experience. In fact, there are many, um, many disciplines, philosophies that basically say that there are many conscious souls out there that are trying to, to be born down here. And most people say, why do they want to be born down here? It's so limiting when they're living in, in a, an expansive universe. Like, no, no. This is such a unique experience mm. that there are many that wish to be incarnate down here and have that experience, regardless of whether it's good or bad. Mm. There's a mind blower. Right. Uh, maybe because it's good or bad because there's a, a, a lesson to be learned here. And not all those that wish to incarnate down here are allowed to or can, because mm. you have to be very courageous mm. in order to incarnate down here. Yeah, it's a, it's a risky place. It's the world's, it's the universe's greatest theme park, is to become within form. Um, and, you know, in that regard, it's precious, and one of the reasons why we consider life here precious, why mm -hmm. uh, why the interaction of form within form or form with form, uh, we are we try very hard not to uh, be a uh, a toxic form which it, it provides a toxic experience to other forms. Um, and you you have that experience. You know what it means to. Uh, experience shadow down here right and not to be overrun by it to to believe that you are less than the idea is to to be able to hold the light regardless of what is happening around you and 
to identify with that light. And I believe we have come to the end of our, our hour. I think we have, but um, I think this has been a, a, an interesting exploration into consciousness and into form. And so let's surrender ourselves to the light of the next show. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Without ego, of course. So I'm Michael Lyons. Oh, and I'm Margaret. And thank you for listening. <laughs>